Good evening, everybody. I'm just seeing everybody start to come in. Thank you for waiting and thank you for coming. My name's Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. And we are delighted to partner this evening with uh, the Watershed um, and a number of other uh, groups who are here to sort of offer their um, wisdom and support on this issue of flooding. Just so you know, I want to make sure everybody is aware that you can add a live transcript option. Um, it should be at the bottom of your menu so that um, if you'd like to see a live transcription of the speak, what, what the speakers are saying, that is always an option. We had hoped uh, that Barbara simpson Vadney would be able to introduce this evening's program. Uh, she was having some technical difficulties and so she shared her introduction with me. Uh, Barbara simpson Vadney is the current chair of the Princeton Flood and Stormwater Committee. As a municipal committee, uh, they, they meet monthly to work on stormwater issues along with the municipal engineering department. There are seven residents on this committee, including a representative from council and the environmental commission. Plus committee members are on the planning board and the site plan review board. We are fortunate to have Sustainable Princeton and the Watershed Institute attend our meetings. Uh, this evening, we have uh, several speakers. Uh, Andrew Filippi uh, with the municipality. Jenny Ludmer with Sustainable Princeton and Corey Kreisder, who will be speaking uh, from the watershed from a number of, I wasn't ready to do the whole introduction, <laughs> uh, from another, a number of different viewpoints. Uh, Mr. Philippe, each, of, each person will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, Andrew, if you'd like to begin. All right. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. Just a minute. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Philippi. I work with the uh, engineering department in the municipality. Um, I haven't timed this one, so we'll see 15 minutes or not, but I uh, just wanted to give everyone an update that we have recently passed two new uh, stormwater control ordinance, 2020-38, uh, 2020-39. Uh, well, they passed back in 2020, of course, uh, but recently went into effect at the beginning of the month. Um, so these ordinances deal with uh, stormwater control whenever there is development. So if um, you know, a home is being remodeled and it grows larger in footprint, or if there is a, um, uh, sorry, a patio or, or um, driveway that's elongated, then that impervious area creates more stormwater runoff and should be dealt with so that it's not impacting uh, the downstream neighbors. Um, so in addition to just residential uh, builds, we also have commercial uh, facilities, um, educational facilities, et cetera. So anytime that there is development within the municipality, uh, they're going to need to be uh, designed um, in accordance with these two new ordinance. Um, the big difference of these ordinance from years past is that there's a very strong focus on green infrastructure, which I'm not going to get into the uh, specifics for green infrastructure. That's going to get covered later on in this meeting. Um, but the basics of it is that we want to treat water, uh, stormwater close to source. We want to allow uh, stormwater to um, filter through vegetation, we want it to um, recharge the groundwater. We want to uh, make our um, infrastructure more natural uh, and you know good for us, good for the environment, um, and good for business. So 
I uh, just wanted to give a quick um, rundown that of these two ordinances, uh, 2038 major site developments, these are um, sites where over 5,000 square feet of impervious area are being added or a half acre of uh, land is being disturbed. Um, this is something that has come down from the DEP and, and we're just um, you know, tailoring it to the municipality. Um, we, uh, we also have minor site developments. So, you know, smaller developments, there's a cutoff if you're doing work that's less than 400 square feet, then, um, you know, it, it's just not uh, significant enough impact to, um, to warrant going through this whole process uh, up to 5,000, you know, major. Um, the difference between major and minor versus large and small is, is generally uh, the exemption from site plan review. So um, there, in simple terms, that's one and two family homes would be large and small, uh, any commercial or educational facilities that are uh, being worked on. Those, those would be in the uh, major minor categories. Um, Again, to save time, not going into a ton of details, uh, but these are very easily accessible. Uh, the easiest option is probably just to Google uh, Princeton Stormwater Ordinance. And it's the first three options are our website. Second option is Ordinance uh, 202039. Third option is Ordinance 202038. So all the details are there, very easily accessible. Um, we also have our municipal website, which uh, was fairly recently updated. Uh, not sure if anyone has looked at it recently, but um, this is our front page, princetonnj.gov. Uh, highly encourage any questions that you have or things you wanna know about the municipality, please go to our website. Uh, we're proud of the new website. We've put a lot of work into it. It's still developing, of course, but um, we welcome you to uh, participate. So uh, in order to get to the stormwater ordinance, uh, from the home page, you go to departments, go to the engineering department, uh, and then from the engineering department, just click on stormwater management down there. Uh, and now that you're on the stormwater management page, there's a quick introduction of, of why we want to manage stormwater. There's contact information on the right. Um, and then there's also uh, three sub pages, uh, one that goes into detail about the uh, general permits or our MS4, our stormwater management plan, um, all of the things that we as a municipality are working on to ensure that uh, overall we're, you know, um, managing stormwater properly. Uh, the second page would be the stormwater ordinance, so, you know, 38, 39, but then also uh, leaf litter and pet waste ordinance, et cetera. Uh, and then the third page is uh, stormwater resources, so educational videos, um, links to uh, other nonprofit organizations like the um, uh, Stormwater Institute, et cetera. Uh, and then something that's kind of fun that we're working on now uh, is uh, GIS. GIS stands for Geographic Information System. Uh, and what we're really excited about for GIS is that it's empowering this uh, citizen science initiative. So, um, at the municipality, we're working to expand our uh, internal GIS capabilities. So we're um, increasing our uh, licensing of GIS products so that we can get all of our staff using it, getting comfortable with it, um, because you know uh, knowledge is power, and applying uh, information on a geographic uh, interface is just very easy to work with. Personally, I love maps. Um, uh, I think a lot of other people do. So <laughs> um, part of our uh, expansion of our GIS capabilities is that we're going to be uh, adding GIS and interactive um, maps to our website. Uh, so we don't have any up yet, but we're working on it. Um, we are going to have information on uh, you know, where we have uh, stormwater infrastructure, where we have sewer infrastructure, where we have easements, where we have trails, um, our zoning 
uh, and zoning ordinance and, and all sorts of stuff that will just be you know a few clicks away um, and so you'll be able to uh, you know zoom in on your area of interest and uh, say okay this is this is where I live this is where I work um, these are the uh, fun you know natural resources around me uh, and that'll I think uh, go a long way to making all, all of us more engaged uh, in our natural landscape. So um, right now, uh, we have actually some volunteers, uh, primarily Princeton University students, the CAPERS team, um, mapping out stormwater inlets in our system. Uh, so they have been focusing in one area. As you can see, all these little blue dots are inlets that have been um, identified by the volunteers. Uh, and uh, they've been you know, going around to each of these locations, saying, okay, this, this is where this inlet is located. Uh, it's in good condition or it's in bad condition. This is the type of inlet it is. Uh, does it have uh, one of those little messages that says drain to creek or, or not, um, et cetera. And, and so this has been a, a really great uh, um, addition to our uh, arsenal, right, of, of information. So. Um, they've been doing an amazing job and uh, you know as we start putting our GIS systems uh, into our website or these maps into the website uh, it'll make it a lot easier for everyone to get involved uh, not just for, for this but for other citizen science initiatives that we're going to be kind of uh, uh, kicking off in the future. Um, in addition to our volunteers locating these stormwater inlets we also have um, we're, we're working with a uh, consultant to take a bunch of our old, very, very old uh, construction drawings and digitizing them. So we are effectively uh, creating right, our stormwater infrastructure system within GIS. Um, and that's going to be useful in terms of uh, us and residents knowing uh, where infrastructure is. So you know, if you want to uh, connect to the stormwater system. If you have some downspouts on your house that you want to uh, get into the stormwater system, um, you know where to go to look for those. Uh, and from our perspective, it really helps us uh, you know, take care of the system in terms of uh, operation and maintenance because we know how much is there. We know where it is. We know what to look for. Um, we know how much uh, inspection we're going to have to do a year. We can estimate how much uh, repair work we're going to have to do a year, uh, and we can have a um, better asset management program going forward with this information. Uh, and I think the the most um, exciting part of you know collecting all of this data uh, and and having it in a, a GIS is that we'll be able to create a hydraulic hydrologic uh, computer model. So what we'll be able to do is uh, within this computer program, uh, say, okay, here's the municipality. Here is the ground surface and all of the contours and elevations. Uh, and here are all of our um, stormwater basins, our BMPs, uh, our pipes, our inlets, et cetera. And we're gonna make it rain in this computer model. And we're gonna see, okay, you know, if there's a large storm that comes through, what areas should we be focusing on? Um, what areas are likely to flood? What areas are undersized in terms of our infrastructure? What areas could uh, use or have the most benefit from uh, targeted green infrastructure? Uh, and so we're very excited because this is gonna be a great tool um, to getting us all uh, into a position to really uh, combat uh, flooding. So I, I'm super excited um, and uh, I hope that you will be too. <laughs> I think that's probably going to take a while. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be until you can at least see this uh, and work with it yourselves on the website, but it's coming and uh, look forward to it. Um, so at the uh, municipality and the engineering department, we're the ones who are primarily uh, working with um, the stormwater system, uh, feel free to contact engineering at princetonnj.gov. Uh, that is the kind of department-wide email. 
uh, but that's the best one to contact because if you email that from first off, it's easy to remember, right? Engineering at PrincetonNJ.gov. Uh, but then also um, based on the content of your email and, and what exactly you're asking for uh, or suggesting, you know, that, that can be sent to the right person. Um, Deanna Stockton is our municipal engineer. So uh, she's the head of the department. Um, she's the boss. She, she knows what's going on. Um, Jim Purcell is our land use engineer. He's the one who's focusing mostly on uh, land use applications and um, you know approving the green infrastructure designs that we're expecting to see. Uh, and then Andrew Philippi, that's me, uh, sewer engineer. I'm, I'm mostly focused on the uh, infrastructure for our stormwater system and our green infrastructure. Um, and then uh, of course, go to PrincetonNJ.gov for more information. Um, it looks like we've got chat. Thanks. I don't know what the chat said, so I'm going to stop That's you. all right. That's all right. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, and next up, that's I already have questions that I've written down, but I'm going to hold them. I see that we have questions, uh, people raising their hand, starting um, after everyone's off their, after each of the panelists has offered their presentation, then we look forward to um, uh, offering your questions. Now we have Corey Kreiser of the Watershed Institute, uh, who's going to speak about how to manage the water that's coming into your property and like what that might look like as a neighborhood. Well, thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. Pull up my screen. Just a moment, it's not letting me uh, pull up my slideshow, but give me just a minute. I'm seeing your slideshow, but oh yeah, you want to present? Yeah. Let me stop this and try it one more time. Okay. Not letting me click on it. Nope. Do you want me to try? Yeah, let me try it one more time, Kim. Okay. Oh yeah, this is gonna give me grief tonight. See if, if you're able to pull it up. Okay. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate that, Kim. No problem. Um, uh, my name is Corey. I'm the stormwater specialist with the Watershed Institute. And what I wanted to talk to you about tonight was uh, the stormwater that's coming off of our neighborhoods and how we can work together as a neighborhood to try and get control over this uh, problem that we have. It's it's actual uh, actually a fantastic resource, but not when it's coming through in mass quantities. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please as I'm hitting enter, trying to get it to go, it wasn't working. Uh, so what? where do we start? How, how do you begin? And you wanna begin with your own property. So what I was thinking about is, is a lot of what I'm seeing in Princeton right now as I'm going on some of these neighborhood site assessments. And I recognize some of you who are joining us tonight have contacted us and um, we haven't been able to um, get get back to you yet to be able to set something up um, and others I have been able to meet with. But 
what I what I hear a lot is that you know people come into Princeton, they move there, and they find this charming, sweet little house uh, that has a lot of curb appeal and charm, and these great mature trees, and they move in, and and in the house. Are, initially has a uh, yeah, small patio that's maybe like 150 square feet, you know, 10 by 15. And in a one inch rainstorm, there, there's all kinds of coefficients and, and equations and everything that you can work with to try and get exact numbers. But what I find to be easiest for the resident who really just doesn't want to get into all those coefficients and everything is to just take your square footage, multiply it by 0.6, and that gives you a fairly close um, number for how many gallons of water your property will produce, your impervious service will produce in a one inch rainstorm. So when you move into this sweet little house and it has a 150 square foot uh, patio on it, that patio in a one inch rainstorm, and I'll use that one inch as my uh, number throughout everything that I talked to you about tonight will create about 90 gallons of stormwater. A 2,000 square foot roof will create about 1,200 gallons of stormwater. And then you've got your little sidewalk there and, and the sidewalk maybe 45 square feet um, makes 27 gallons of stormwater. And then you've got your driveway and, and that an 800 square foot driveway may create somewhere around 480 gallons of storm water. Um, and, and then you have a storm drain at the end of your driveway. So it's great. You, all the blue arrows are showing you your downspouts, where the water is flowing to. You've got these mature oaks there and you're, you're pretty much taking care of your own storm water on your property. So, and next. So um, it's, you're, you're doing pretty good. It's not too bad. And, and a great thing about your property is you've got these mature oaks. If you go, if you Google tree benefit calculator or you go into treebenefits.com, you can type in your zip code, put in the type of tree you have, and then the size tree that you have, and it'll tell you approximately how many gallons of water your tree will absorb in one year. So if you've got four mature oaks on your property, one northern red oak at 45 inches will capture just under 24,000 gallons of water in one year. It's a lot of water. It's almost 100,000 gallons of water that your property is capturing. And the, the total amount of water that your property was creating in a one inch rainstorm was just under 1,800 gallons of water. So your trees are more than making up for that. But things change. And so if you go to the next slide, Kim, as time goes on, you have kids, things start to change, maybe your um, entertaining style changes, and you start to add things. So you add an addition. And this is not to scale, it was just to try and give some ideas. So let's say you add a 1,600 square foot addition, um, that's going to create about 960 gallons of stormwater. But that addition required the removal of one of those trees. Then you add a pool and a, a terrace, so that's about 2,000 square feet of impervious surface that you've added. Now you've added another 1,200 gallons of water into the storm system. Um, and that also required the removal of a tree. Then you increase the size of your sidewalk. And this, this could be over like a long period of time. It's just while you're in the house, you're thinking, you know, I'd really like to change that or that would make it look a whole lot better. Um, but it does affect, if it doesn't affect you, it affects whoever's downstream from you. And you could also lose trees to um, age or maybe some kind of um, uh, disease. So maybe you've lost another tree, which is very common. So now you've, you're, you've lost three trees that are basically sucking up 75,000 gallons of stormwater a year. And you've created another 4,640 square feet 
to your property, which is almost 2,800 gallons more of water that is being created. And your, your sweet little house that used to basically be self-sufficient with capturing its own stormwater is now either creating some problems for yourself or creating problems for people downstream. And that could also be going through the storm drain as well, because that storm drain has to outfall somewhere. And somebody downstream is going to be capturing the water that is now coming off of your property. So I'm not attacking anybody. People make um, upgrades to their property all the time, but it, we definitely need to think about how much water are we creating and where is it going? Next, please, thank you. So uh, just, just remember, all changes that you make to your property, think about where it's going. Next, please. So where do you start, what do you do? Besides starting with your own property, you wanna stand outside in the rain. So I'm often, I talk to people and I'll say, have you stood outside during a rainstorm yet to see where the water is flowing? And they haven't. And this is something that's really important. Just stand out there and enjoy the, the peace and quiet and look to see where this water is coming from. What do you see? What is the source? Follow that water. Where is it going? Is it ponding in your yard? Or where you know there are problem areas in your yard, figure out, you know, so go to that problem area and then backtrack where the source is coming from. And sometimes it's making its way underneath that liriope that is beautiful and lush in your yard. It's not native, but it's covering the 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 source of water. So you need to sometimes dig around and figure out where it's coming from by moving some of those plants. Next, please. This is another example of a property that I went to where I, he, he was being flooded. His basement was, it was very wet. And when I went there, um, I couldn't quite figure out where the issue was. Now, um, my I couldn't, I'm sorry that the pictures are the way they are, but the, the driveway is in the upper left-hand corner there. And then the back of the drive is the larger picture on the left with the water moving down the drive towards the street and um, making its way around to the, to the picture on the right. So when I went there, it was a nice sunny day and I couldn't quite tell where the water was coming from but then it was pouring one day. So I stopped by his house just to look and his driveway seemed to be um, sloped in a way that it, all the water would drain out to the street. And there's a storm sewer right out there. But when I went there, I realized, oh no, that's, that's not the case. The, the driveway actually has all of these kind of little waterways from years of settling and, and use and that water is coming down the driveway. Um, and then you can see in this, the uh, picture on the left there, along the brick wall, there's a pipe and that's his downspout for basic, for half of his roof. And that was coming down alongside the brick walk where the yellow star is, that water is coming in from his neighbor's house, which wasn't very much, but it was enough to contribute. And then it moves down that brick wall and ends up going close to the brick wall, hugging it, and then going right around the corner on a sidewalk and straight into the side of his house. So he was actually flooding his own property. And this is one example where I didn't even catch it until I was out there during a rain event. Next. Another example is your downspouts. This, this particular one was, when I looked at it, it was raining again, and there is a metal edging where that red line is, metal landscape edge. And probably due to cutting the grass, the extension for the downspout had been pushed back behind that metal edge. So all the water coming through that pipe hit the edge and then flowed back towards the foundation. 
So his entire roof was flowing right back against his foundation. The, the downspout coming off the back of the house and the downspout in the front of the house. And so that was con contributing greatly to his water issue. So it's really important to get out there and look to see, uh, are you doing the same thing to your own property? Next. Other factors that influence runoff are if you have buried pipes. You don't know if the pipe underneath is crushed unless you're standing out there during a rainstorm and you see it backflowing against your foundation. Water does typically flow downhill, although um, in Hopewell it doesn't in one location, which is a whole nother story, but it typically flows downhill. We have clay soils and after years of use with either cutting the grass, kids playing in the yard, uh, pets running around in the yard, um, and then uh, mature trees that are maybe shading it, they start to become compacted and that soil does not absorb water and it just sits in ponds right at the top. Other things that we do, which I see I have a typo in hardscaping, on the lower left is we, we, we put in this great landscape edging. So here they put in that brick um, edging going around their uh, landscape beds and it looks beautiful, except the downspout that's going down right behind that flower pot has no place to go except for into the yard. And that landscape edging is damming the yard. So it's just ponding right there with no place to go. As years go on, the trees that um, we planted or originally were installed when the house was built get diseased. They might get old, they might blow over in storms and they die. And, and we don't really think about reforestation of our own property. So once those trees die, we lose those massive sponges and it takes a lifetime before we see something like that again. So it's really important to think about replanting trees in your own yard just so that you have that next generation that is sitting there waiting when another one goes down. And then on the right hand side um, on the bottom incorrectly placed trees. So the, the pink line, um, I was trying to draw an arrow in there shows how water is supposed to flow through the yard. And, that, and then the goal was that it would continue to flow um, past that tree, past that red line, except they planted a pine there and the pine now is getting mature enough that those roots are lifting the ground up. And so that has created a damming effect and stopped the water so that it can't continue to flow down towards the street. So it's now ponding in the backyard. So what do we do? Talk to your neighbors for sure. Um, go for a walk with them. This is what I've been doing with the neighborhood stormwater assessments is just uh, gathering concerned neighbors and then walking the property and hearing what they have to say. So this is really helpful even if you don't have somebody like me or um, Sophie Glovier who's our policy specialist. She has been with me on uh, most of these walks. If, if neither one of us are there, that's fine. It's still good to walk with your neighbors or to hear what they have to say about flooding that they're experiencing in their own yard. And then once you, you talk more to each other, go ahead and reach out to us and we would be happy to be able to talk to you and try and figure out maybe some plans for attack on um, getting control over this stormwater issue. Next, please. So what do we do next? Research. And this is, this is basically what I'm doing too. So I, used, I, I like using Google Earth Pro because you can go back in history. And this is the neighborhood that, um, I forget the name of the neighborhood, but it's right off of Kyler Avenue. And um, so what I was looking at is trying to compare tree canopy. 
from years past. So on 2006 on the left-hand side compared to 2018 on the right-hand side. And I just circled areas where you can see that there's a change in tree canopy. The, the circle on the very bottom there, you can see a huge change. There's clearly an, an infill or a, um, a new development going into that, that property. So a lot of trees were cleared from there and getting ready to build a new home. And just each one of those circles shows that there is a change in tree canopy. And since we know that these trees absorb so much water, this creates um, a lot of stress on neighboring properties or um, the storm sewer and people down, downstream from all of us. Next, please. Now, I'm really excited to hear uh, what Andrew had to say about the GIS because I think that's super exciting too. We have at the Watershed Institute, we're able to create topographical maps like this one so that I can see how the water is flowing off of the property. But right now online, the, the topo maps that you're able to get are in 20 foot intervals, which really is not very helpful. And from what I had heard also, uh, Mercer County is supposed to have, I think this summer, um, five foot interval maps that they will be posting on their website that'll be accessible for the public. But um, once Princeton has theirs, I'll be on that one for sure, checking that out. But just keep in mind when you do look at topo maps that water flows off of those lines at a perpendicular angle. So even though you and your neighbor may be downhill at what seems like the exact same elevation, one of you may, may be flooded more than the other. And it may be because just those topo lines and how they're flowing, it'll send water in different directions because of that. So this is helpful in determining, you know, just why the, the landscape or why water is acting in the way it is. Next, please. The other thing that I think is really cool, um, I like maps too, is going to the historical society or to your local library, or this one came from Princeton, and finding historical maps. And I'm sure that many of you on the call tonight can see or, or know that there are streams and waterways that are buried underneath Princeton. This one I thought was pretty excited because I knew about there, I just didn't know where it was. So this one shows that the headwaters for Harry's Brook are buried underneath uh, part of the town and where exactly those headwaters are. Next, please. The other thing that's helpful to look at is looking at the web soil survey. And that one you can just Google web soil survey and, and pull it up. This is just a screenshot on the left hand side from the uh, home page. And then when you do your survey for your property, they'll give you a report, which is what you see on the right hand side. Next. And in the report, you'll see something like this, which, you know, for, for some of you, you may glaze over. But what's important about this is that it, it's telling you characteristics about your soil that may be very revealing to why your property is behaving in the way it is. So what you're gonna wanna look at is the, the drainage class. Does it stay wet? The runoff class, does it erode? Uh, the depth to the water table, and then the hydrologic soil group. This one in particular, it, if you look at the bottom of the screen on the left side, it says hydrologic soil group D. What does D mean? So if you uh, look at NRCS, the definition for D is very slow infiltration rate. High, and it has a high runoff potential. Then you might say, huh, that makes sense. So instead of trying to battle it and putting in plants that you think, I want this plant in here, why won't it survive? Find plants that like this kind of soil. 
look at it differently. Like you, you're constrained, you can only use certain plants because that's all that's gonna survive in, on your property. And I digress, I'm going in a different direction. So I'll, I'll come back to what we're talking about. So next, please. So what are we gonna do next? This as a neighborhood would be fantastic if you could do this. Um, there's there's a, a county in Kentucky where I saw this every drop, which I thought was pretty pretty great. If if everyone captured every drop where it fell, how would that ease the flooding burden downstream from us? So consider putting in rain gardens in each yard. Um, remove invasives. We have a high density of invasives in some of our wild areas. Remove those because they're not doing anything to help with stormwater or to help the environment. So have a, a neighborhood event where you're removing invasives in, in some of the wild areas of the, of the neighborhood. Um, and then replace it with native plants. They absorb so much water and, and they're they're from here, so they can handle our, our uh, climate. Uh, replace ornamental plants with natives. Now that bottom right hand corner is beautiful. The colors are beautiful. The different textures to the leaves are beautiful, but they don't do anything to help with stormwater. So why not put plants in, have it look like a, a flower bed, but just make sure that flower bed is doing it another job, which is capturing stormwater. Consider aerating your yard and overseeding it and then um, back, back filling it with your mulched up leaves in the fall. Don't bag those leaves up. They're like gold. They're worth their weight in gold for sure. Um, mulch them up into the yard so that they can, they can benefit your turf. Or have a neighborhood tree planting each year and you can reach out to um, the arborist Taylor to see if uh, he would be able to help you. I'm not sure what his schedule is or it, what the planning is, but definitely reach out to him. See if he's able to help organize that. Next. Now, if you want to install a rain garden, these are two manuals that are really helpful. I They basically say the same thing. Uh, so I personally like the one on the left-hand side. I just think it flows better and um, is easier to read, but they're, they're fantastic. You want to install a rain garden, follow that or call us, whichever one is easier. Next. The other thing is when you're planting trees to replace a tree, um, go on this tree benefit calculator. I know we all love Japanese maples. Well, not me, but others like Japanese maples. So compare it. How much does a 20 inch Japanese maple intercept in one year? Well, according to the tree benefit calculator, 2,132 gallons. But a red maple, look at the difference, 5,926 gallons. And we all love cherry trees too. But the cherry trees that are so, you know, beautiful pink flowering trees are not native to here. Again, they don't capture that much. But a black cherry that is native not only feeds the um, wildlife, but it also captures a whole bunch of stormwater. So just think about that when you're installing um, uh, trees, plants. I, there are some cultivars out there that are really beautiful, some um, ornamentals that are, that are beautiful. And I think a couple of those are just fine, but try to be heavier on the native side to help with that stormwater and um, benefiting the ecosystem. Next. Other things you can do is shrink your lawn. Um, that, that would be a huge benefit. Um, installing a cistern, installing porous pavement, or even in, installing a downspout, downspout, excuse me, downspout planters. And they can be anything from um, a livestock tank to a wood box. There's all kinds of stuff online. Philly Water has um, specs as well as Rutgers to be able to find information on how to make these. Next. The other thing you could think about is trying to get creative. Now we've, the stormwater um, ordinances in Princeton require 
certain amounts of water to be captured. And maybe in some properties, this will be really tough. Maybe the, um, the uh, groundwater level is already pretty high. So you can't install a rain garden, but what if instead of putting in that arborvita for a privacy screening, you put in a cistern. Now for some of you, you may think this is stupid. I will never do this. Others may think of it as, wow, this is the problem that the, the, um, the answer that we, we needed for the problem that we have. So it's just trying to throw some ideas out there on how to capture some of the stormwater and to navigate that ordinance. Next, please. A, a lot of you also have a lot of slope on your property. So you have steep hills, but those steep hills can be a huge benefit in installing rain gardens. Now, in the, these are just examples. On the left-hand side, it's not a rain garden. They've turfed it, but you can put in a retaining wall like this to be able to capture some of your storm water. Um, it, I'm sorry put in the retaining wall, and then instead of having that turf, putting in a rain garden to be able to capture some of that stormwater. On the right-hand side, they have their downspout connected to this retaining wall, but it also is capturing sheet flow from the neighboring property. So there, there's, you, you can be pretty creative. And these really work really well on soils where maybe it's very um, clay and it does not absorb water. By putting these in, you're basically uh, backfilling it with rain garden soil that is spongier and can handle the amount of water that it'll capture. Next. Another thing that you can do is consider community rain gardens. This is also um, in, Kyle, in the Kyler neighborhood. And um, th this is an area where the neighborhood just pointed out that they have problems there. The soils seem to be pretty good and it might be a great location to be able to put a rain garden in with some signage to help educate people. So once we start seeing these popping up in, in people's uh, neighborhoods and their properties, it might become a little bit more popular and people realize that they're, they're not scary. I'm not sure if, if that's something that people think, but they're not. They're, they're a breeze. They're basically a, a flower bed that is doing double duty. It's, it's, it looks pretty and it's capturing rainwater. Next, please. And here's the other, the, another great thing. When you start doing this, you start installing all of these native plants, nature returns and it's cool. And this one, uh, these pictures came from one of our watershed members. They installed a rain garden. They've installed, um, they naturalized their detention basin. They've um, put in all kinds of native uh, trees and shrubs. And she said that to walk 60 feet down her, her driveway to get her mail each day sometimes takes her 45 minutes because she just keeps stopping to look to see what's showing up um, what is in the yard, what is feeding off of the different plants in her yard. And it's, it's easy to start to get distracted and just that awe and wonder of, the, of nature that we have that disappears. But the minute you start putting in native plants, it comes back and it's so cool. Next. And then just consider um, looking into our river friendly program. There's a lot of practices and recommendations that are included in this program that'll lead to better stormwater management. And like I said, I just encourage you to have a look at it and, and try to become a member. Um, it's, it's a great program that is beneficial to not only businesses, golf courses, residents, and schools. Next. And this is just my contact information. I also have added Sophie's. I know that many of you know her since she is a Princeton resident, but she's also our municipal, uh, municipal policy specialist. And um, the two of us work hand in hand quite a bit with any kind of requests that come in for neighborhood evaluations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny and thank you so much, Kim, for uh, driving. Thanks so much, Corey. And now uh, Jenny Ludmer from uh, Sustainable Princeton will give you some tools now that you've learned that it's best to work with your neighborhood about just how that might be possible. 
Oh, sorry, I was, I can't believe that still happens. I was muted. Uh, great. Thank you, Kim. Um, let me just get my slides up and running. And um, there we go. Okay. Um, so tonight I am hoping to uh, share a little bit of information with you about the STAR Neighborhood Program. This uh, was a program that we um, developed about a year or two ago. Um, and the goal of this program um, is for to give residents the opportunity to engage with the Princeton Climate Act Action Plan or CAP. Um, so there are a series of um, actions that we offer and neighborhoods actively select what they feel is appropriate for their neighborhood, what they feel like they could take on um, that would make their neighborhood more sustainable um, together and resilient, hence the acronym. Um, and then another component of this program is that it, it engages people in um, friendly competition. Um, and we definitely like to celebrate all the achievements that people make um, in this program. So, so far, we actually have 10 neighborhoods within Princeton that are registered in the program. We're really excited about that. That's a new milestone for us. Um, and back when we had eight neighborhoods, we counted that meant that there were over a thousand um, households in this program, though that number has certainly gone up. So um, getting started in the STAR Neighborhood Program, I've tried to make it um, very easy. Um, the one thing that we do want to do is kind of figure out where you want to draw the boundaries for your neighborhood. A lot of people um, get a, caught up in this. It's not supposed to be stressful. You can always start small and go bigger. Um, so just start wherever you would think back in the good old days when you could have a block party, who would you invite? That's what I tend to say. So it might just be your block. It might be three blocks, um, but that's up to you. And then um, you want to have a phone or email list uh, for all of these neighbors because you're going to need to be able to communicate with them. Um, uh, so that's the second thing to develop. And then you want to make sure you're not doing this alone. You want to have another person or two to work with you and together to establish um, goals for your neighborhood. And like I said, these are up to you. We give you many choices, but we really want you to pick. We want this to be grassroots. We want it to be what you want to see, the change you want to see in your neighborhood. And then once you have registered with the program, you um, earn points by doing activities. The scale is set up that there's things that are real actions that take a lot of, you know, presumably more effort, um, get earn you more points versus things that are education, like maybe your um, distributing flyers like uh, the woman in the picture is my neighbor um, and so it, it depends on the type of activity that you take um, but there are points for it um, i ask you to uh, document your efforts and what i mean by that is send me a great picture like this picture <laughs> um, so that so that we get to share what you're doing um, with other neighborhoods and other other residents in princeton Let's see. So just, I would love to run through a few highlights of what neighborhoods have, what these 10 neighborhoods have taken on in Princeton. Um, and the actions span all kinds of different areas. So some people have taken on energy actions. The picture on the right is a person who had a home energy audit done and she took a lot of great pictures and wrote up a story of what it was like and shared that with her neighbors. Um, another thing that a lot of neighborhoods take on are waste um, actions, so they might all, um, there's a countywide waste collection effort going on at the end of this month, and so the neighbors will come together and only one person from the neighborhood drives um, the, the collectibles for that event, and so it reduces the number of cars on the road, the number of people that have to take their time out of the day to do it, um, and it encourages more people to know about this event and participate in it. 
Um, but of course, tonight, what I really want to highlight are what neighborhoods have done to improve stormwater or manage stormwater better in their neighborhood. Uh, so Corey already showed you these great um, analyses that the Watershed Institute provides. A number of the neighborhoods, star neighborhoods, have started with this action. And it's really a great way to get to know your neighborhood and understand where um, the water issues are coming from and how you can potentially solve them. Uh, one of the neighborhoods also invited Corey from the watershed and Taylor, um, who is the municipal arborist, to um, discuss how once they got this analysis for their neighborhood, well, what can we be doing um, to manage it better? Um, and that event I have heard through the grapevine is leading to neighbors um, uh, pledging and working together to plant more trees in their neighborhood. Uh, so that's really exciting and education is certainly a big part of this program. Um, another uh, thing that can happen is that you could be learning together. The picture on the right is from um, one group of neighbors that kind of did a field trip together to the Watershed Institute um, where they had a class for residences to learn about installing rain gardens. And um, so it was great that they went and got that education together. And then of course, um, you could come home and uh, put a rain garden in your front yard, which is the picture on the right. Um, other things that have happened to improve uh, or help manage stormwater are planting trees. That's the picture on the left, like Corey was mentioning, that's a great activity for neighborhoods. Um, another thing that hasn't come up yet, but I know Andrew would appreciate is um, adopting storm drains. We've got two neighborhoods that have taken this on. Um, so the neighbors simply identified the storm drains in their neighborhood and then people would sign up to monitor them. So when they find them looking like the middle picture, um, they get out a rake and a bag and they uh, clear them. And they, I know, um, some people just do this regularly once a week. Some people do it where they will just are watching the weather. And if a big storm is coming and they know that there's going to be a need for those clear drains, they get out there before him. Um, so it's whatever you envision it as. So that's a little bit about the different actions. And then, like I said, each of these actions the neighborhoods choose to take on um, give the neighborhood points. And then I collect all the points and calculate them. And if you trust me, this is what the points look like now. It's um, definitely a race. The A neighborhoods, you saw some of their pictures in this, um, are always, since they've been a part of this, been leading the pack. Um, and the other neighborhoods are hoping to catch up and hopefully by the end of a year's work meet um, bronze, uh, silver, or gold level. This was the report halfway through the year. So we know three of the neighborhoods are going to make that goal, but the others we'll see. Time still tells, will tell. Um, so that's not all. I just have given you a piece of what these neighborhoods are doing. I would encourage you to go to our website, sustainableprinceton.org star, um, to see what other neighborhoods are doing. Get inspired to do some of this in your neighborhood. And if you sign up, please know that we do have access to mini grants now. So if you want to put in rain barrels um, or plant trees, in your neighborhood, there is funding available to do that up to $500. So we would be delighted to have you um, join our program and apply for one of those grants. And um, again, I just want to thank all of you for um, being here tonight and learning about this. I am the uh, Community Outreach Manager of Sustainable Princeton. There's my email. You're welcome to reach out to me if you want to learn more about the STAR program. And of course, I do not work in a vacuum. I've got uh, Molly, Christine, Samuel, and Nicholas all on the team at Sustainable Princeton. And I will pass it back to you, Kim. Great, thanks so much. Well, um, everybody's bringing back their cameras. Uh, so 
and hopefully Barbara will be able to join us. Hi, yay! <laughs> Barbara's here. Uh, so we've had this wonderful overview, Andrew presenting from sort of an infrastructure municipal point of view, uh, Corey giving us the you know, overview from like the point of view of your home and a lot of really um, straightforward ways that you can sort of mitigate what's happening on your property and also how we can work together. And if you're not sure how, if you, how to get to know your neighbors, we have Jenny Ludmer who's provided this wonderful option. Um, so I don't know, Barbara, since you didn't get a chance to speak earlier, if there's anything you want to say at this point before we go into the Q&A? Um, I just want to say there's amazing amount of work that's being done and it's being done by the municipal workers, you know, Andrew and land use and, um, and um, Deanna also, and with the nonprofits and we, and the, representatives on the committee, there are scientists and engineers and concerned citizens. Um, the mapping, we have a lot of help from students and volunteers. And um, it's just really good to see all of this information and all of this hard work um, that folks are working on. And I'm really glad that the public library uh, presented this program. I'm get, really glad too. I learned so out. much tonight. <laughs> uh, so one of my my questions uh, is also a question that's in oh it's gone. Uh, well, it, that was in the chat. Will the public have access to the studies done by the engineering department specifically regarding the impact of major construction in sensitive error areas um, like Autumn Hill? So, um, yeah, I, I typed in the uh, answer to that one. Uh, so, yes, generally, uh, any studies or, or reports put together by the engineering department, um, it's a public record. It's, it's, it's absolutely open to anyone to look at. Um, there are some potential restrictions. I'm not familiar with this uh, exact issue. Um, and if it's something that is of a, a you know, private development and, and has to do with someone's um, home, uh, we won't necessarily share that, uh, but it sounds like maybe major development is, is a more um, you know, larger uh, kind of public or, or commercial interest. So um, yeah, I mean, and as we go forward, right, collecting information, doing these studies of, of where we want to um, uh, implement, you know, kind of community, uh, uh, municipal funded, um, green infrastructure projects, you know, all of that's going to be very open and, and we're going to be getting as much community input as we can because we want to know where the issues are. We want to know where um, people are going to appreciate, uh, uh, you know, the landscaping, right? We, we want this to be um, something that, that everyone has uh, kind of a, a sense of ownership for, right? Because the worst thing we can do is, well, I guess let me put it this way, right? Green infrastructure is um, amazing, but it's only as good as it is maintained. <laughs> as Corey loves to point out, you know, if, if, if we don't have uh, a, a community ownership of, of these resources, um, then it all gets squandered. So we're very uh, interested in, in working with the community. Uh, we're going to be as, as open and, and you know, forthcoming as, as we can be. So. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, the next question comes from Karen O'Connell. Um, you know, I think that there's quite a lot of, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of plants solutions. Um, and Karen would like to know, you know, are there any restrictions of replacing grass with native plants between your sidewalk on the curb? I can't remember what that area is called, technically speaking, because it's sort of your property, but not your property. Maybe Corey, could you answer that? Or I don't know, Andrew, is that you question? Uh, <laughs> I should know. Um, I, I don't know the specifics off the top of my head. I, I will say this, um, that area generally is public right of way um, and is, is seen as a part of uh, the transportation system and, and needs to be maintained. Um, 
by the municipality in most cases. Uh, and as much as we love the idea of having all natural vegetation, um, that's uh, asking our staff to um, maintain that sort of infrastructure is too big of an ask yet. <laughs> Uh, we're not ready to maintain that sort of thing. And we are very concerned about maintaining um, the infrastructure, right? The roadway, making sure that the sidewalks are safe, uh, making sure that uh, there's there's not, for whatever reason, you know, if a plant gets uh, planted there and, and now it's causing cracking in the uh, pavement, uh, you know, those are very serious safety concerns, um, visibility as well. So. Uh, it's something that I would I would ask that you get in touch with the engineering department prior to making any sort of plans to work uh, within the right of way. I know Jim uh, Purcell is is more versed in this sort of stuff, um, but uh, yeah, it, you know we are definitely looking into uh, ways that we can install green infrastructure within the right of way that you know it's it's a lot of space that we can uh, get a lot of the advantage from um but we we need to do it in a way that's uh very well planned out and, and something that our staff can can maintain properly so yeah as andrew notes i think having you know working with the engineering department where possible but also you know remember that that's a place where town can come in and they they might want to take everything up so you might not want to plant really expensive things in there <laughs> too or things that you're willing to move uh lee farnham says is the green team working with you or is that sustainable princeton so do we have a green team in princeton or just sort of sustainable like there are green teams in different towns uh, yes, there is a municipal green team and my uh, colleague Christine serves on that along with um, different municipal staff um, and council members. Um, but I'm not sure that I understand the question um, in terms of are we working with the engineering team or I, I don't know if it can be restated. But Sustainable uh, Princeton also serves on the Flood and Stormwater Committee um, with Barbara. But again, that's mainly my colleagues, uh, Molly and Christine, that do that. And there's an okay. Environmental Commission liaison on the Flood and Stormwater Commission Committee. Great. I don't know if Lee will want to rephrase that, but Lee, please uh, feel free to reach back out in the Q&A or in the chat if you want to uh, follow up with another question. Uh, one of the questions that uh, also came up for me, uh, Corey, maybe is the, you know, you were noting that as you might build additions or make changes to your property, that that affects how water is absorbed. And so are there any places that have guidelines like, okay, I've, I've created this much impervious thing, I need like one oak tree and five grasses or anything like that. <laughs> um, like a practical, like sort of rule of thumb for how you can mitigate when you make changes? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, the trees, they, they're they so little when you first put them in and they just, they they don't do a whole lot, I would say for the first couple of years, but, but then they start making a difference. If you go onto the tree benefit calculator and you start, you know, putting little increments of changing the size of the tree, to see just how much it, it's absorbing, you know, it may seem pretty um, dismal in the beginning, but um, it definitely starts to pick up speed. But um, there is a book called um, Designing for Flooding. And I've um, mentioned it uh, in, in the past, so some of you may have heard this already, but this particular book was done, I think it was in um, 2009, it was written in Philadelphia so it's like really valid to our area. And what they were saying in there is that a one acre um, of, of mature deciduous forest can absorb 550,000 gallons of water. And uh, one acre of mature meadow, so that's our native plants with those big long roots, which some of them um, 
I don't know if you know what Leatris, the blazing star, it's a, a flower that has a long purple spike on it um, that can get up to six feet tall. That it has eight foot long roots and those roots absorb a ton of water. And that is, you know, it's, it's a perennial. So it dies back each year and comes, comes back. One acre of mature meadow can absorb 500,000 gallons of water. So plant those native plants because those roots, you know, uptake and absorb so much water. It's, it's really surprising and it doesn't take very long for it to make quite a, a difference in your own property. I would say within the first growing year after it's become mature. Absolutely, and I have to make a little library plug here. The library has a really wonderful gardening section uh, with a lot of native plants with thanks to uh, Friends of Open, Friends of Open Space and the Master Gardeners and some other groups that have like helped us guide and bolster our collection. So please come to the library to check out our books. Um, but also, Corey, maybe, or Jenny, if you want to suggest a place that's some online that people could go to sort of get good resources for native plants. Uh, sure, we have a list of several different um, vendors on our webpage um, under Take Action. We have a section about your yard, um, but I can mention the super local one, which is DNR Greenway. They have um, periodic native plant sales, typically in the spring and the end of the summer fallish. Um, so I would definitely check out their webpage to see what they're doing this spring. Great, we have a question. Um, is, are, are we, do any of you, Jenny or Corey in particular, know of any landscapers who could focus on designing to manage stormwater flow? Yes, most definitely. So we have uh, a program uh, certification that we've just had our second one. We're uh, planning on having them, well, we are having them every year in February. But this year, it looks like we're going to have a second one because there's a demand for it. So it's the Watershed Institute Green Infrastructure um, Certified Professionals. And last year, we had, I believe we had 20 people go through it. This year, we had 21 go through it. So we do have a list of uh, landscape designers, design build landscape firms, landscape architects, engineers. So that is something that I can definitely provide. And I we've just built a part of our website is called um, exploring green infrastructure and we're starting to add all of these resources to that part of the website so that um, homeowners property owners can go there and have all of that information there um, i don't have the list of certified people yet so i'm not sure kim if that would be best to provide that to you so you can send it out um, but it is something that we're planning on having our, on our website within the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, well, maybe just let me know when it's up and then okay. I'll send. Okay. Uh, and just as we're, you know, coming up to the time, we, we don't want to keep everybody. Um, you know, are there any sort of close, closing remarks that you'd like to make? Um, you know, maybe that's if you had like one thing you wish that people would know to do or to do. Uh, that we could close out with. So I feel like uh, Jenny could go for. Oh, Andrew, go. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah. So uh, Jim Purcell, the uh, land use engineer, he uh, had another meeting tonight, so couldn't make it. But um, he's the one who generally reviews all of these um, plans for development, right, including green infrastructure, stormwater management, um, and he wanted me to say that even though our stormwater control ordinance is fairly prescriptive and, and can get confusing um, and seems kind of uh, difficult to, to meet all of the requirements, that um, it's, it's absolutely doable. Um, and where there are some uh, issues that might require some flexibility on our part in terms of, um, you know, allowing multiple different uh, uh, types of uh, management practices um, and being creative. You know, we're, we're, we're here to help. Um, we want all of these uh, projects to go in, uh, to be, uh, you know, something that's valuable to 
the property owner, the developer, um, to the community, uh, to everyone. So, you know, we're, we're here. Uh, we want this to work for everyone. Um, so let's have fun with it. I would say the public's welcome to attend the flood and stormwater committee meetings. They meet on Zoom the first Friday of the month at 10 a.m. They usually go to about 11.30 and the public's welcome. You can find the information on, on the um, Princeton website. Um, April is on the 9th, April 9th, because of the holiday beforehand. And I'll just mention too that if, if anybody is in need of assistance with just you know some education or some guidance with stormwater on their own property, we are always willing to uh, help with that. But then also, I, I just to ask a favor of, of everybody who's listening tonight, if anybody has some ideas on um, a webinar or some kind of education that they, they're really missing out on that they would really like, please let us know. Uh, it might be something that we're missing or just you know, had no idea that that was uh, an interest out there and we would be more than happy to try and provide that as well. Um, and I'll just uh, close with uh, a, a quote, be the change that you wanna see. So take a look at your neighborhood and think about what you wanna do in your neighborhood um, and, and work with your neighbors to make it happen. Sometimes it is that easy. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for coming and providing so much information. Barbara, I'm really glad that you got to be able to make it. And uh, <laughs> everyone have a wonderful evening. And I hope that your, your basements are dry. Mm -hmm.